Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this amazing um, uh, Saturday. Uh, today, um, a special Saturday as all the Saturdays that we get together um, to meet and speak and, and, and learn from one another and share our ideals as well. Uh, today, a little special or let's say with a different taste because we're doing things a little bit different in terms of uh, who are we presenting, who is here with us today, uh, but more to come on that. Um, today, um, we would like to present um, everyone who is here before I go on and um, um, give some information about what we will be discussing today, as well as the, the timing of everything. Do some housekeeping. Today. We have here with us today Abigail um, Francisco from the, uh, the Spirit Set of North Beach, along with Leah Gouveia as well. And we'll today we have our special guest, Susanna Simons from Florida. Um, who will be speaking with us about depression, addictions, and suicide, and how can spiritism help? And it's a question um, that we should be asking this to spiritism, um, and we'll be, we'll be bringing a lot of information to help us. Um, as I was saying, this is a collective work, um, for not only of the Spirit Society of Baltimore, but the Spirit Societies of Maryland. And today we have here uh, the representation, as already mentioned, of the Spirit, um, Spirit Society of North Beach, uh, Miguel Francisco and Leah Gouveia. We also would like to mention that um, our friends, unfortunately, could not be here with us today. Cynthia Fabretti from the Bezerra de Menezes Spirit Society, Dr. Sonia Doy as well from the Alain Kardec Spirit Society of Maryland. Um, who will be um, actually who's working on another endeavor right now, Spiritus Endeavor, that is, um, and me from the Spirit Set of Baltimore. Um, it is a joy to be here with all of you. Welcome, everyone, um, to this amazing moment. What we would like to do is to go over with you and explain that this is going to be um, a two hour special, um, let's say, condensed um, workshop that our dear friend Susanna uh, Simons will be speaking with us. Uh, she, she's she will be speaking for one hour, and then we'll take a break for about five five minutes or so. Um, we're not gonna uh, um, stop the, um, the the recording or the the transmission, uh, but she will take a break. Uh, we'll make some announcements, and then we'll go ahead and, and let her speak for another hour. And we'll give you um, time to um, um, uh, say your comments, say your questions, and we'll try to answer um, them as much as we can depending on the time that we have in our hands. Since I spoke a whole lot and I gave you a lot of information, what I would like to do is to invite our dear friend Abigail to say our opening prayer, and then she will pass the word to Leah Govea, who will introduce our speaker uh, for today. And with no further ado, we'll pass the word uh, to Susanna Simons. Please, Abigail, um, introduce us to this uh, special afternoon. Um. First, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Susanna, for taking this time to prepare this wonderful workshop to us. Right now, then, I would like to ask for all of us to relax our thoughts and elevate our thoughts to our dear Father. Dear Father, dear Master Jesus, we come to you this afternoon to ask him for your blessing and help. As you are gathered together to learn from our dear friend Susanna, please bless her with all those prayers that we us today. Because we need to understand every topic that we're going to discuss, enlighten our minds, and guide Susanna words. May this meeting bring success and growth to all of us. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings and for this time together. So be it. Thank you, Abigail. Leah, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Susanna Simões with us. Uh, let's learn a little bit more about her. 
She was born luckily uh, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She's Carioca. She was raised in a spiritist family and moved to the US 25 years ago. Professionally, uh, Suzanne is a doctor of physical therapy and one of the founders of the Conscious Living Spirit Group in Miami. She's a worker of the Spiritist Movement, and we are very happy to have you here with us, Susanna, to talk about this topic that's so much in need these days. Welcome. Thank you, um, Leah. Well, before, I'm, I'm so sorry, Susanna. Before we go on, I would like to also mention uh, to everyone that we are, uh, are streaming this as well um, through the, um, the, the the Facebook page of the Spirit Study of Maryland, as well as through the um, Spirit Talk through um, our um, YouTube video, YouTube location. So um, please follow us and I'll pass the word to you, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you. Susanna, I think you're in mute. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, we can. Sorry. Thank you. All right, all right. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much for the invitation, for the opportunity to speak about this um, very important topic. I am, um, I have um, actually, I was commenting with our friends that we have plenty, plenty material to go over for a long time, but we will stick to the two hours and we will try to bring up what is um, the most um, important things. Um, I might go a little fast over a few of the topics. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to go too much in depth. Um, to try to cover um, as much as possible um, about these three different topics that in itself are pretty big topics. Um, each one of them could be in itself a two, three hours um, workshop. I would like to say uh, hi to everybody who is uh, listening to us. We are going to bring our presentation uh, on so we can get um, started. Okay, right here, very good. And we are going to, um, the presentation is divided in three uh, parts. So we're gonna talk about uh, depression, then we're gonna talk about um, drugs and addiction. And then finally, uh, we are going to talk about um, suicide. Understanding that although these are separate and distinct topics, they are intertwined and, um, you know, um, one, one thing is very much uh, connected to the other as we will um, have a chance to see. So we're gonna start with depression. Um, I think depression is uh, very often in the basis of, um, you know, um, seeking and escaping into drugs as well as escaping life through the doors of suicide. So since it is the base, we're gonna start by taking a look at it first. Um, understanding that this is a, a massive problem that we have today in our society. As you can see on this slide, when we talk about uh, psychiatric uh, disorders, um, we have uh, depression in second place, just second to uh, actually anxiety. And in terms of, uh, disorders that affect our quality of life, it's second just behind cardiac um, disorders. So it has a big impact in our society and it has been defined by the American Psychiatric Association and American Psychological Association as a uh, being a major depressive disorder, a common and serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel the way you think and how you act. Fortunately, it's also a treatable disorder. It causes feelings of sadness, loss of interest in activities that once um, someone enjoyed, 
And it can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems that can decrease the person's ability to function in life. So different than the way we saw and understood depression in the past, I apologize. I don't know if you guys hear my dog is going crazy on the background. He'll stop soon. But um, in any case, uh, different than we used to think. We used to think that was a minor thing, that washing some uh, extra dishes or clothes would cure. Today we have a much better understanding and uh, comprehension of the seriousness and how deep this disorder uh, affects one's life and also how prevalent it is in our society, which really causes us to, um, to think and to wonder what is missing and what can we do to help the ones undergoing uh, depression. Iris Sinatra, who is a psychologist that works um, very close to Givaldo Pereira Franco, uh, the Brazilian medium in Brazil, uh, and that studies the work of Joana de Angelis, who looks at uh, spirituality and psychology in spiritism. She says that depression is like a rust that takes over the entire body, a newness that uh, of the body that compromises the mood as well as the thought process. It affects how one, again, sees the world and perceives reality, how we understand life and how we manifest emotions and how we feel pleasure. It's a disease, she says, that hurts the soul. And depression can be manifesting in different ways. I mean, usually and most commonly, we tend to think about this major depressive disorder, but um, there are individuals who will feel depressed at certain times of the year or in um, conjunction with a, a specific uh, traumatic event at a certain period of time of the year. There is depression postpartum, there is minor, there's dystonia, which is like this um, subtle uh, depressive mood that goes on for like a long period of time. So it's nothing major, but it's always there that that low, that blue, that, that persists and that uh, prevails. So it's important that we recognize and understand that, you know, there are many different ways in which depression manifests. And here we just put, you know, a very few examples. When we think about the signs and symptoms, um, it's important to recognize them and to understand that in order to be diagnosed for depression, you don't necessarily, it's not that you have one or two, you have to have um, a combination of uh, the signs and symptoms leading to the diagnosis of uh, depression. And so they are feelings of uh, sadness, which may or may not be present. We're going to look at that. Um, lack of interest for activities that once um, someone enjoyed, changes in appetite that can be weight loss or weight gain, trouble sleeping that can be not sleeping enough or sleeping too much, decrease um, energy, increase in purposeless uh, physical activity, feeling worthless or guilty, difficulties thinking, concentrating, making decisions, and many times thoughts of um, death, thoughts of um, suicide. What are the, what are the feelings uh, that uh, people commonly have when uh, they're feeling uh, depressed. And again, I'm going to go back to this reference by Iris Sinatra when she says that depression is this very painful, subjective experience that's almost impossible to be described for the person who's undergoing depression. Um, the person has this feeling, this sensation of having losing something extremely and profoundly meaningful for himself or herself. And some of the very common feelings associated with depression are powerlessness, loneliness, abandonment, and particularly loss of control. You have no control and you have no power over the events of your life. And I really want to highlight those two uh, factors. Now, as I mentioned before, 
depression is not only or always sadness. And why is that important? Because it might be someone depressed near you that has no sadness and therefore you might not recognize as depression. But in a society like ours where it's still many times men are not told, for instance, that they can or they should cry, then a lot of times um, feelings of sadness will be experienced by men with other manifestations, such as irritation, such as frustration um, or anger even. But it's not going to be manifested as a sadness necessarily. So it's important that we be aware of that the sadness is not always um, at the the center of depression, as many people uh, tend to think. And, and this is, um, you know, something perhaps um, where I want to spend a little bit of time now with you, talking a little bit about uh, sadness. Because um, I truly, truly believe that sadness is um, you know, precedes many times depression, although, like I said, it's not always there, but it is uh, something that is commonly present. And it, if we understand sadness, if we comprehend sadness, as if we comprehend our emotions, we are much better off uh, and we are much better able to deal with, um, with life and to prevent perhaps understanding our emotions and particularly in this case, being able to understand what sadness is truly about and being able to better deal with sadness is perhaps the most powerful way to prevent and to avoid depression. So we're gonna take a little bit of time and look into sadness as I put on the slide as a primary prevention uh, for um, depression. And we're going to start with um, this definition by the spirit, G.S. Cruz. It is found in a book called Pills of Hope, not yet translated, but he has the Pills of Trust, which is uh, another book from the series that I really, really recommend for people who are um, struggling, who are having a difficult time. The helps um, in building your trust and connection with God again. Pills of Trust. This comes from Pills of Hope, where he says, emotions are the natural thermometer of organic, psychic, and spiritual boiling that takes place in nature. They represent deeper movements within the soul. They signal feelings that are harbored in the heart. So when we take this um, these, uh, statement, I want to highlight two things here. He uses the words emotions and the word feelings. So emotions, when we think about emotions, we think about these, um, these uh, uh, symptoms, these symptoms. They come and go, and they are present in our lives to bring information about what's happening deeper inside our souls. So if we stop and pay attention into our emotions, sadness being one of them, then we can get into the more structural part of our beings where we have our sentiments. Sentiments are deeper and they are more structural, where the emotions are symptoms and they are more superficial. Let me give an example. You can be very happy and experience a lot of joy as an emotion because deep inside the sentiment that you have is love or gratitude. Or you can feel um, uh, very, um, we can have envy in as a sentiment deep in the structure of your being and it's manifesting as irritation. That would be the emotion. That if you stop and understand that emotion, it can actually be the bridge that's gonna take you to the core structural sentiment that you need to understand and you need to work with. So this is what basically Gius Dacruz establishes for us in this uh, statement that emotions are then uh, symptoms. And so when, when what happens is when we feel emotions, 
we should welcome our emotions. We should embrace our emotions, understanding that they are messengers, messengers of our own soul. They come, they're there uh, to tell us something about ourselves. When it comes to sadness, we have a um, particular challenge with this uh, emotion because it's not really cool to be sad in our society today. And the other challenge that we have is that we are very unskilled to deal with sadness. So we're gonna look at those two possibilities. Why is it uncool and how unskilled are we in dealing with sadness? So it is uncool and uh, this is uh, Joana de Angelis um, who tells us that there is today in our society an obligation of joy. It is intense the stimulus to external achievements to certain appearances. They're often empty of real meaning and do not fulfill life's goals. As a result, there is an attempt to hide feelings and emotions, conflicts and sufferings. Many depressed individuals make an effort to maintain their routines, faking a state of happiness and keeping an indifferent attitude in regards to their inner world. So it is true that we live in a society today where we almost have this obligation to market our own happiness at all times. So this is unfortunately one of the um, bad sides of uh, our social medias, um, such as Facebook and others where, um, and I'm often playing with this, you might be with your family in the beach, at the beach, um, you know, having a miserable time where people arguing, basically killing one another. But at some point you pick up that phone and you say, hey, everybody, let's take a selfie here. And everybody smiles. You place that with a beautiful background on Facebook and the world thinks that you're having the best time of your life. And that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. You're just about to kill one another. But it markets a, a happiness that is not even uh, there. And there is this incredible pressure. Uh, for us to, to be happy, to be happy all the time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on this afternoon. But going back again, you know, to um, all these uh, obligations, these external achievements that if you don't get there, you're not considered successful. So, um, you know, if you are not fitting into this category where everything is going so well for you, then you're almost ashamed. You're ashamed of having feelings of sadness, of inadequacy, uh, your frustrations. And then people are, um, you know, forced, so to speak, to, to hide, to hide their own humanity, their own vulnerability. So I think that one of the big things that we can start doing uh, in our society that I think it would help is talk about our humanity is to share our our vulnerability so that people understand that yes we have great moments and yes we have moments that we too struggle so people understand that you know what you're struggling let me tell you something you are not alone we all are struggling all of us at one moment or another we're together in this struggle in this um, immense vulnerability that is to be human this is something that we need to talk more we need to share more we need to uh, make it more visible so people don't feel so ashamed to be where um, they are. So, but in addition to that, we are also very unskilled. So if I would ask you and I would say, um, you know, when someone comes to speak to you and that person is very sad, what do you do, right? So a lot of times, um, many of us feels like, deeply deeply uncomfortable with someone who is sad next to us and um the first thing that uh we are going to say is we are going to encourage that person and we're going to do so by saying don't be sad right don't be sad um and and a lot of times we we'll say things like um oh you're feeling sad you know what do you want to go out let's go eat something you're going to feel better immediately or how about if we go shopping tomorrow? You're going to feel better. You're going to distract your mind. So we have um, 
to be all we have all these um ways in which we want to distract people or help people to feel better like as quickly as possible and that happens even inside this spiritual center right um so part of it we we part of it and the reason why it's so difficult to deal with one sadness is because we have a difficult time dealing with our own sadness um just very recently and this happens uh, really really recently <laughs> because i have been dealing with a lot of sadness lately in my personal life um so i was sharing my sadness with a friend who said to me um and i was very very sad that day so my friend turned to me and said why don't you take something to help you to sleep tonight and and this is it um you know people are taking pills not to feel uh sad and i just said to her um no 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 i it's okay uh thank you though i i rather cry i rather feel it i don't want to not feel i i would I, I need to feel it's important to feel and we're going to talk more about that but um, so this is basically how we deal with our sadness uh, at this point. So let's see what Joanna says to us. She says the sadness must be understood as a pause for the comprehension of the existence. As a psychological transitory phenomenon, it should yield space for med is meditation, sorry, and awakening without complaints and resentments. So I love this sentence. Since I've seen it, I have reintegrated into my lectures that sadness is an ingredient of a healthy menu. So this is something important because, and we're gonna talk again a little bit more about happiness in the second part of our lecture, but to understand that, you know, sadness is a, a very much a part of happiness. You cannot experience happiness in its more perennial and deeper way if you're not able to feel sadness. Because sadness opens space for, for growth, opens space for understanding, opens space for creativity, for expansion of the mind, of the consciousness. So it is important that we understand that, you know, when you say, I want to be happy in 2020 or whenever, that this means that sadness is going to be part of it. Well, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, moving on, um, Gias da Cruz is going to, um, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened here. Okay, here. Yeah. So Gias da Cruz is going to say, Listen to the mass generated in the sacred soil of your body. Oh, oh, okay. A person becomes enslaved by the effects of emotions when he or she does not attend to them, to the emotions, missing to recognize the root, the cause of such emotions. So. Once we identify the emotion, right? So we are invited to listen to the message that the emotion uh, brings. When we don't listen to the message, when we eat instead, work excessively, uh, whatever it is that we do to distract ourselves, take pills, right? We miss the opportunity to, to, to learn what needs to be learned. And we become, as he's saying, um, enslaved by the effects of these emotions without uh, understanding what is the cause, what is the root, what is beneath the emotion that needs to be attended. So here's a suggestion of a very simple practice. And it seems um, silly, but actually it's not. Uh, name the emotion. And I say that because not everybody knows how to identify and name emotions. So first thing that you need to do is, what is it that I'm feeling, right? I am what? A lot of times, um, in, for, long, for the longest time, I had a difficult time with anger. So I would say that I was frustrated, that I was irritated until the day that I actually learned what anger is about. And I was encouraged to put the name to the emotion. So first thing you need to know what you what you feeling, what is the emotion? Once you identify and you're able to label it, then you need to ask what is the feeling behind the emotion? 
right? What is this emotion? What triggers the emotion? When is exactly that I feel this emotion, right? So for example, when you are grieving the loss of someone, uh, when someone is um, in the process of dying, you're already dying, and you enter the grief process, then what happens is there's usually a lot of sadness. But if you ask yourself, okay, you say, okay, I am sad, but what is the meaning of this sadness? Why am I sad like this? And if you stop, a lot of times with the dying process, for example, we are going to recognize that part of the sadness is because the person is no longer there with you, but also part of the sadness is a lot of guilt for things that you wish you had done differently. A lot of the sadness is resentment. A lot of the sadness is unfinished business. A lot of sadness is related to regret because what happens, you start looking at that relationship and then and a lot of sadness is missing moments. So that sadness is made of so many different things and has such so many different meanings to the sadness. So it's important that you actually, if you rush to do things, let's say after you lose someone that you love and you don't open space to feel, to speak, to allow that sadness to be, if you numb it, you're gonna lose an incredible space and opportunity to understand uh, all the meanings and to do the growth and to learn from that particular uh, experience. So we really um, are a fan of this idea of like cultivating our emotions as a primary prevention for all emotional disorders that we can uh, talk about. So this is really facing forward the problems as opposed to, you know, what we're going to talk in the second part, which is like escaping to drugs, to addiction or taking our lives. Right. But cultivate emotions is a primary prevention. So what does that mean? It means that we will be doing some uh, trimming. Um, so as we go through our emotions, let's say sadness we are going to perhaps um, realize that there are some things that no longer serve us to be there. So if I'm feeling guilt about something and that's part of our, that sadness, I can trim that guilt by forgiving myself. I can uh, trim that uh, guilt by, um, uh, by self-love, by self-acceptance, that what I did was the best and open myself to um, a, a, new, a new experience. But most important than that, it's a lot, it's important that we allow ourselves to cry, right? I think, like to think of our souls as a very dry land that um, as we cry, as we feel, allows the, the, the land to be nourished and we need to fertilize. We need to fertilize by um, cultivating, um, values and, and virtues that will allow us to heal little by little. So I really like this idea that our emotions need to be named, needs to be understood, and need to be properly cultivated. It does not mean that we're going to be nurturing sadness. It means that we're going to feel appropriately, we're going to do the inner work, and we are going to transcend. That's what usually what it takes. I also like to think the emotions are like rivers. So an emotion must flow. It must flow like a river. So when the river flows freely, it brings life. It brings life in abundance for every single area that it goes uh, through. So blocked emotions, when we don't allow our emotions to manifest themselves, what happens is we create flood on one side of the blockage and drought on the other side of the block. So we are creating an incredible source of disharmony and imbalance within ourselves. So it's important that we allow movement, we allow the flow of our emotions. Very well. So now that we touch this um, uh, particular area of sadness, we're going to move back into uh, the issue of, um, of um, depression per se. And as we can see, depression has a genetic, an organic, as well as an emotional and spiritual component to it. So in terms of, um, let's go back, let's talk a little bit 
uh, about uh, the genetics. So it seems to be evidence that if you're born in a family that has a history of depression or even other psychiatric depression uh, disorders, that the person is more likely to uh, develop depression as well. Although um, a gene for depression has not yet been identified, and it's certain that genetics alone cannot explain and be held accountable for the manifestation of depression. When they look, for example, at uh, twins, only 40% of uh, identical twins will both develop uh, depression. So it has to be other factors um, behind depression. It's definitely organic. And by that, I mean, um, you know, we have a, um, a chemical component, a biological, physical component uh, to depression that has to do with the balance of our neurotransmitters, um, our main ones, noradrenaline, serotonin, which is one of the primary neurotransmitters that um, is related to depression. We have dopamine, acetylcholine, and GABA. So those are the main neurotransmitters that um, you know need to be balanced, need to be working properly um, in order to um, to keep us uh, healthy emotionally, uh, uh, psychiatrically, uh, in a state of uh, of balance. And then we have the emotional and the spiritual. That's really where we want to uh, spend more time uh, with you. So. When we look at the emotional and the spiritual aspects of depression, right? So Joana de Angelis again is going to help us by saying that a lot of times what we see is the past emerging and flooding into the present uh, moment and finding us. So when I, when I talk about the past, I'm talking about the past in our current life, like say my early childhood, right? Or the past from many lives. So our past reincarnations, our feelings, our emotions, our tendencies, they tend to resurface and, and flood the present moment. And in the present, what happens? In the present, these emotions are going to find a spirit that is unprepared many times to deal with the challenges of life. Going to find minds that are disconnected from life's real meaning without understanding what is the true purpose of our lives and why we are here. We're gonna find minds that are um, not ready to accept God's wills in a state of rebelliousness as um, defined by Joana de Angelis as well, which is all of us, by the way, right? Because we, although we do the Lord's Prayer and say, you know, that we want God's will to be done, uh, that's not necessarily true all the time. And then we have also uh, spiritual uh, influences. And I say that jokingly, but truly, uh, when you go back to the gospel chapter three, we understand that rebelliousness is the main characteristic of the spirits who live in planets like ours of trial and expiations across the universe. So if you think that there are other planets like ours out there, we what we all have is a common denominator between spirits here and there, it is the rebelliousness. It is the difficulty in following God's laws and in accepting God's wills over our will and the spiritual um, influences. Now, okay, so I did talk about, um, uh, I'm sorry, about genetics. I did talk about um, brain balance and then uh, these spiritual uh, factors, whether it's the past that resurface or also um, the spiritual influences. But look what Joanna says here on this slide. She says the incarnate spirit finds in itself his entire evolutionary history with its achievements and mistakes calling for attention. The most serious conflicts from the past are responsible for the installation of brain disturbances, triggering the depressive process. Even if we consider the hereditary process and its exogenous causes of depression, it is the spirit always the one pulling the trigger of the process. It is therefore the spirit's responsibility to reverse the situation. So we're gonna see here in the next slides that it really doesn't matter where you place it, whether you place in the genes, 
whether you place in the brain or whether you go to the spiritual causes, we are always, always, always talking about the spirit. The spirit is where the process always begins. It is the spirit who is triggering all these manifestations, whether it's genetic, whether it is uh, the chemistry of the brain or anything else, any physical manifestation. The source, the beginning is the spirit. There's one approach right here. So she's going to talk about um, our past inheritance uh, in form of predispositions and tendencies affecting our um, our DNA. So <clears throat> when we think of that, we know that when the spirit is in the process of reincarnation, right? The spirit with its tendencies, with its um, impulses, with its emotional needs is going to imprint in that particular DNA its needs. So there's actually an influence, and in, I'm going to go over this very briefly and very superficially because of the time. But what is important for us to understand is that the spirit is active in the process of reincarnation, not only in the selection of the uh, sperm, uh, as well as in the way that the DNA is structured. It has the influence of the spirit. So our past experiences, our emotional needs are going to affect our uh, DNA. Now, we are uh, tied to the past. Can we, uh, I'm going to ask for the slide to be made a little bigger so I can read that. Um, thank you. So if we are tied to the past, we have the power of our choices and the raw power of the mind in the present moment. So what do I mean by that, right? So yes, so we might think, okay, we reincarnated, now we have our uh, physical body and our DNA marked by these, um, by the past. So can we do anything about it? Do we have any power to change that, to change how those things manifest in the present moment? So we also hear today about epigenetics. So we know that 5% of our genes are activated from the get-go, and 95% of our genes need to be activated. The question is, by whom and how are those 95% of the genes activated? So let's say that we do have a gene for depression in there somewhere, right? Or that tendency is very strong. So here's what happens. You know that the DNA is in nuclei of the cell. And we know that from the nuclei, some orders are sent to the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, we have the production of proteins. They're going to be used for a number of things in the physical body. So what happens is we also have in our blood circulating some important uh, cells that are going to bind to um, the cell membrane. When those cells who are circulating in our blood bind to the cell membrane, they trigger a signal that activates our DNA in the nuclei. And the DNA sends an order to the cytoplasm to say, do this or do that, produce this protein, produce that protein. So science tells us that, you know, what triggers this entire process is what we eat is uh, our level of stress has to do with the environment that we live in, but we go one step further than science. And to all these components, they are truly, truly determine the cells that are binding to the membrane of the, the cell, right, to trigger the whole process, we know that there is the immortal spirit with its mind, with its emotions. So we know that it is the spirit. The spirit has the power to actually activate and trigger the manifestation of certain genes, turning on and off the, the, the genes uh, themselves. So, <clears throat> okay, so 
the power of our genes is relative, although at times it is absolute. Why although at times is absolute? Because even though we have this 5% and 95%, let's not forget that we are all under the law of cause and effect. There are certain things that no matter how much we can work our minds, right, to prevent um, in, in exercise of self-love, it is for our best interest that certain diseases or certain things are going to manifest in the present moment because they will mean in ultimate uh, instance healing for our souls. So, yes, some things are going to happen inevitably because it is the absolute best for us in this present life and it is under the law of cause and effect. But within that, there is room room for all of us to use the power of our minds and to use our thoughts and to manage our emotions and to make choices that will actually affect how our physical body is responding. So I might have, for example, the gene of diabetes, which I certainly do. My entire family is diabetic, but will I manifest that necessarily? No. It depends on how I care for myself, right? My feelings, my, my, my thoughts, the care that I take uh, with my body and with myself, it will ultimately, um, you know, uh, allow that to, to happen or not, turn on and off that particular gene, okay? So this is an important idea because it empowers us. We are not, remember that in the very beginning, I was talking about feelings of powerlessness, and victimization with this idea that spiritism brings to us we are now seeing that for one we are not victims we are responding we are um we are reaping and sowing at all times the the results of our own experiences our own choices our own actions throughout time so we are not victims, but most important, and this is truly, truly one of the most powerful things I think I want to say today to all of you who are listening, is that we have the power. We have the power to change our present moment. We have the power to change our lives, to change um, our health, to change our realities. We can do that. Our physical body, our system is responding to the impulses of our minds into the impulses of our hearts at every single moment. And even science today already recognizes that. In speaking about the power of the mind, we enter the last, one of the last aspects, which is uh, the obsessive process. And a lot of people um, blame and really put into the spirits, um, you know, the, the, the responsibility for, um, you know, depression, saying that, you know, people come to the spiritual center and say, I'm depressed or I'm this or I'm that, you know, I think, I think I'm, I'm really uh, obsessed. As if the person is not part of the problem, is not part of the process, right? So um, we're going to look at um, obsession. We uh, need to understand that yes, obsession can be the initial cause, or you can start a depression process without an obsessor, but end up, you know, having an obsession process added to um, the depression uh, in first place. Okay. One important concept is what I put it over there. The obsessor does not invade our home. He's our guest. It's really, really important that we understand this concept. So it's not someone who broke the door of our home, broke the window, invaded our home. No, it's someone who was actually invited, invited by us. Person knock on the door, we open willingly and let the obsessor in and we have a connection with that obsessor. And why is that important to understand? It's important to understand because, um, you know, it's also up to us to say, I no longer want your company. 
it's not that I'm going to hate you or, or anything like that. We can transform our relationship to a healthy relationship, or I would rather be away for now. And we have ways in which we can do that. So um, one other uh, factor outside of uh, the, the obsessive process is the rebelliousness. And he is again, Joana de Angelis uh, is speaking to us. Dissatisfaction with oneself, conflict born from desires, not attended frustrations, guilt at the root of the depression. The depressed person suffers from inability to accept life as it is. It encloses itself in a movement of withdrawal from life. If I cannot have it in my way, then it will be no way. So it's, a, it's as if the person at some point decided to refuse to leave. So it's not what I want is not the way that I want, then I won't live anymore. And the person uh, withdraws and goes within. And that too, when, when look under the lens of psychology can be a very uh, important in key moments. Sometimes when the person reaches out for help, that going in so deep and withdrawing opens the space for um, the person to see and to to realize and to really discover um, a lot of uh, a lot of areas within that need to be healed and that can that need to be addressed. And a lot of people who will experience depression will surface and will come out of it stronger, more resilient and with a better understanding of who uh, they are. But on the core of depression, when we look at depression from the spiritual perspective, we are looking at this difficulty in accept life as it is. So it's almost like arguing with God. Listen, God, this is not what I want. You don't want to give me what I want? Okay, I'm going to stop playing. I'm not going to play anymore. And you just walk out, so to speak. So we're going to close this. First part here, looking at, you know, what would be the treatment, right? So for sure, I haven't um, been able to read a lot of the comments. I did see that someone uh, talk a little bit about uh, medication. Um, yes, medication is, is uh, needed. Uh, we did speak about a um, imbalance of neurotransmitters. And so that part is important to be addressed. And Gilles de Cruz is interesting because um, um, there's a comment here about the stigma about mental and emotional imbalances and the need for professional treatments. Yes, uh, you know, Gilles de Cruz, he also speaks about, he has one particular uh, chapter that's only on medications. And he speaks about how uh, spiritists in particular, they can be, um, it very uh, proud and say that they don't need uh, medication when it's it, he speaks that as a sign of pride and not understanding that medication and, and, and medicine is a branch of the divinity on earth. And there are times where, yes, we need to understand and accept our own frailty and reach out for the resources that are available. So depression has a biological component that needs to be addressed with the medication, followed by psychotherapy that will help with the assistance of professionals uh, who are able to, because a lot of times some of these emotional um, difficulties that we have are extremely, extremely painful, very disheartening and can make you feel like if your world is, is, is falling apart and the ground underneath your feet is opening and you feel like if you're gonna die, literally. So having a professional that can walk with you, hold you and feel you safe in the process of looking at your feelings and emotions is absolutely important and necessary. The spiritual offers, um, the ability to know thyself, in other words, take responsibility, allows us to leave the place of victimization and gives us the power of our lives um, through self-understanding, empowerment. Uh, you, 
you responsible for the reality of today, but you also have the power of making this today different and tomorrow better as well. So the spiritist therapy, which is, you know, I brought many texts of Juan. I talk about Jesus the Cruz. So one of the greatest resources is um, studying, is reading, is participating in the, uh, the study groups. Uh, reading the psychological series of Joana de Angelis is one of the most um, greater contributions I think that spiritism has when it comes to issues of depression and psychiatric disorders. Um, in addition to the gospel therapy, the gospel at home, prayer, uh, passes, and all the sources that um, the spiritist uh, center and the spiritist groups can offer. And what is our role? I think our role is to um, do be better with our own selves. We, um, it's difficult to help others when we are so unskilled in dealing with our own feelings and, um, and uh, emotions. So taking care of ourselves in first place so we can better attend to others. Pay more attention to others. A lot of times we are so, so incredibly caught up in our own little world, in our own problems, in our best friend, a neighbor that we see all every day, a coworker is undergoing feelings of depression, is undergoing a difficult time, and yet we are completely blind. We are unable to see. Now, not always we are able to see. And I think a lot of people feel extremely guilt often because they were unable to help. It is, like I said, I think it is important that we live in a society where there's less stigma about just being human. We have, I mean, forget about depression. We are so ashamed of our own humanity. It's actually very sad. And so everybody's in the closet with their own humanity, right? And the most important thing is for us to be able to embrace the human in us, because when we do that, we'll be able to embrace the human in others. And if we have a world that's a little bit more open and a little bit more compassionate, people will not feel so lonely. We are very, very lonely and isolated with our struggles. We don't feel like, and this is one thing that I think is very important for us to reflect, is our spiritual centers today a safe place where people can come in and, and put on the table whatever miseries, whatever difficulties, whatever frailties, struggles they are undergoing and feel totally embraced and not judged and find someone in the spiritual center that can say, you know, I'm here with you and you're not alone and I love you no matter what, you know. A lot of times we, when someone comes in sad or depressed, we, we, we rush to to say so many things. We, we need to speak because we are very uncomfortable just feeling. Perhaps the most powerful thing that we had to do wasn't say anything, was just to say to the person, I'm here, you know, do you want to share anything with me? Do you want to just, you know, people come in and, and, and we notice that they are sad and we start talking a whole bunch of things, right? But we could have just said, I'm here. I'm here to listen. Sometimes we don't need to say anything. In fact, sometimes there is not much to be said. What the person really needs is someone that can gently and lovingly listen because they will go back home feeling, oh my God, someone listened to me. And just the fact that they are able to speak and they are able to verbalize and to get from within that chest will bring that particular person relief and when we are relieved, we have more clarity to think. So sometimes I hear that sometimes people at the spiritual center say, I didn't know what to say. I didn't say much. I just heard, but I couldn't say a word. And I say, you have no idea how much you probably help that person just by doing that, just by being that person who sat over there to listen, because now that person can go home with the chest a little lighter, the heart a little lighter, and be able to think better, be able to reason, whereas before he or she couldn't. So 
I think this probably is a good time for us to take a little break. And um, before we go to our second part. Susanna, thank you so much for all this information that you brought us right now. Um, a lot of information um, that we would like to stop and digest, right? And uh, But there is more. Um, we have another hour or so, a um, little less than an hour for us to continue. Um, this is a moment, folks, um, that um, we're going to give um, Susanna some time to catch her breath, drink some water. I would like to share with you some of the announcements. First of all, I would like to thank you for your comments that you already made, posted, um, um, whatever avenue you're following us. Um, and um, keep coming. I would like to just invite you to do more. Um, ask, um, and we're going to certainly um, give ourse ourselves some time to, um, to share. I would like to share with you a um, um, couple things. Uh, number one, I would like to make a, a correction that earlier um, I mentioned that Cynthia Fabretti is um, from the Germantown Spiritist um, Society. Uh, I'm sorry, from the Bezerra de Menezes uh, Spirit Society, but it's actually um, the, um, going back here, uh, my slides as well, so I can follow it. <laughs> it's, she's from the Germantown Spirit Society. Um, the, the, you will find more information um, from the spirit societies that are um, uh, participating here, coming together. Um, in the amazing project here of bringing Susanna for all of us today um, in the slide that I will present you soon here um, for us to see the website as well. Um, the, the, the Spirit Societies um, of Maryland um, mainly is united in the purpose of, a fr in, of friendship um, and have come together to promote the education of the mind and heart by promoting spirituality through the understanding of the spiritist teachings. Um, you can visit one of the, um, uh, the our websites, um, try to find out which one is the closest location uh, to you. Uh, one of the things that I also would like to mention is that um, these different websites will have a tremendous amount of information that you can find uh, to give you more details on the topic that Suzanne is speaking with us today. Okay, and um, our mission statement um, is unification of the Spiritist Centers in the state of Maryland by working on the dissemination of Spiritist teaching um, in our communities. Um, and this is why we're together. This is why we're, um, um, we have done um, works um, together and we are again together to this afternoon to bring this amazing work. Lastly, uh, connected with this topic as well, I would like to share with you then November 21st and November 22nd, we'll have a, um, a special event. It's going to be the first International Spiritist Congress, um, and that will be the virtual first virtual uh, International Spiritist um, Congress. Uh, this is sponsored by the International Spiritist Medical Association, and you can actually go to the website um, that is actually on your screen again, um, and you may want to take a picture uh, because you will need to uh, register. It's free of charge, but you have to make sure that you register um, to partake in this amazing collective work um, by many doctors um, from all over the world, from Canada, England, Brazil, Portugal, Colombia, um, and you can get get to know a little bit more about the program as well. And um, again, this is um, um, for those of you who have partaken this um, um, this medical congruency, you can learn a whole lot. You don't have to be from the field. You don't have to be in the medical field. If you are, even better, because you will be able to incorporate the ideas, the teachings that Spiritism brings to us along with what you do, as our dear friend Susanna does here um, in, is doing here with us, connecting the science, um, uh, the conventional science of today with Spiritism as well in our lives, bringing to our contacts to our lives in the day-to-day -day lives. So um, again, a lot of information that you can uh, go back. Uh, we'll put again um, the, the, the slide that has the information of our spiritism uh, slash md.org. This is where you will be able to find information on all of the um, the, the spirit side of Baltimore, of, of spirit side of Maryland, excuse me, um, and we'll have detailed information. And you can go to each of the spiritist centers um, uh, website from there as well. But again, 
um, a, 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 an amazing amount of information that we can share, uh, that you can learn with us. Um, you will have also information uh, pertaining to the meetings that we hold, um, the, the times and everything. So please um, log in, um, enter it, and, and make sure that you are uh, sharing um, your concerns with us if you have anything. If you need help, please ask for help. As, as we heard from Susanna, um, we're, we, we have to get out of this idea of living in a society uh, that we are ashamed of. We're here to help. We're here to guide. Um, we don't, uh, us spiritists, we try our best as humans um, to extend a hand um, and to live what we are learning. Um, otherwise, there is no purpose um, beyond that. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, I believe our dear friend Susanna is um, re rested. <laughs> Five minutes, if we can call that Very rest. rested. Right? <laughs> ready <laughs> ready I'm, to roll. I'm, 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 I hope that you had some water at least. <laughs> I did, I did. Right. I have right here my water. We, we do have some questions, but um, hold your, your thoughts there, for friends, and, and, and share with us. But we will be um, sharing them at the end. I know Susanna already kind of went through a little bit on them, but we'll, yeah. we'll definitely try to share them at the end. Go ahead, Susanna, please. Thank you. All right. So, um, you know, I, I did want to spend more time with depression. Like I said, it's... Um, I think it's the main main topic for this afternoon. Now we're gonna go a little bit into drugs, prevention, prevention, spiritual influence, and path to healing. I will um, uh, go a little fast over these. Um, I will skip some slides so we can um, get to the the last part um, as well. Okay. So let's start. Uh, one second. Oh, here it is. We're going to start again going back to Joanna Giannis when um, she defines happiness by saying that happiness is unchained by the harmony experienced by the spirit, the pleasant feeling of a duty that has been fulfilled, more righteousness, which allows within the brain the production of dopamine and other similar substances. So I think this is a really important uh, definition. It has a second slide, but before we move forward, um, she's talking about happiness and she's defining happiness for us, um, us the uh, fulfillment of our duties, our duties uh, with God, more righteousness, but she's also highlighting that happiness has a uh, physical component when she says that, um, you know, it triggers the production of uh, dopamine in our brain as well as other substances. Careful experiments with computer tomography show brain areas where, brain, where happiness and unhappiness are located as a result of emotions and physical phenomena produced by dopamine and other substance conf confirming the thesis of an organic nature. So it's not only uh, for us incarnate beings, um, a mental experience, mental being, uh, the mind being part of the spirit, but it's also, and I want to make that clear, a physical, organic, uh, biological uh, experience. When we think about our, our uh, brains, we are thinking about this amazing um, organ that is um, responsible for incredible things that we have seen uh, in technology, in science, in arts, in engineering, in our world, beautiful minds have produced really, really amazing, um, amazing things in our world. But the brain does more than that, more than these amazing things. The brain also is responsible for very basic and primary functions that we take for granted. We don't think about them, such as survival like breathing, like memory, like uh, taste, like what we see, sounds, they're decodified. And also it, it is the brain that puts us to sleep uh, every night and where the, our dreams are, are, are played. So the brain has um, a lot of uh, uh, basic uh, functions. And one of the functions that the brain has is also the, the processing and the experience of uh, feelings of uh, pleasure. Feelings that we experience, for example, when we eat, when we have sex or the excitement 
uh, that we feel with a, a victory or also the pleasant feelings that we experience when we intoxicate ourselves, for example. All this that we are talking about has to do and relates to the chemistry of our uh, breath. It is about the neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter um, connecting to um, a, a membrane of another neuron and starting a whole circuit of, of pleasure. Um, and when we take a first sip or, or experience a, a drug for the first time, we're experiencing a, a feeling that that circuit has never quite experienced before uh, in that uh, way or you know, whatever drug that uh, might be. So, but we are not, we are not um, talking about only uh, chemical uh, addiction here. We're not only talking about alcohol, uh, drugs or opioids. We are also talking about behavioral dependencies. And although the research in, that, in this area is not as robust, there is also very uh, strong evidence that the same areas are lit and triggered when we eat, uh, when we shop, or when we spend, um, you know, tremendous amount of time on our social medias. These also speak about uh, the same circuits, the same areas of pleasure, um, of um, the sensation uh, of joy that is different than the sensation of joy that Joanna spoke about, but nevertheless happens organically um, and is experienced as joy and happiness um, by ourselves. So when we look at the causes, um, again, we can look at genes, we can look at availability, um, you know, there are few alcoholics in dry countries. There are few shopping addicts in impoverished communities. So availability is definitely a, uh, a factor. The cause of addiction, much like the individual, it affects are complex, complexly unique. But from behavior fixations to chemical compulsions, answers may lie in our brains, our genes, and the greatest greater world around us. This is a uh, from a, an article that is in one of the time special editions, which actually are, are really, really nice. And it talks, it was a whole, um, uh, a whole magazine dedicated to uh, the science of addiction. And I think that this uh, statement speaks very well to the, the, the reasons that we see for uh, addiction from a materialistic perspective. That's pretty much what explains it. But when we go to beyond that and we look with Joana de Angelis, she says that in the psychogenesis of drug addiction, there is a bewildered spirit, insecure, sometimes rebellious, that brings with it from the past a heavy load of frustrations and defiance. And so, <clears throat> sorry. And so, Joanna Giangeli is going to identify again, again, we're looking at the spirit here. And we're looking at a spirit who has compulsions, who has behaviors, some of them started in this life, some of them comes from uh, other, other, uh, other lives. And, but also here we see again, the word rebelliousness, right? and we look at frustrations and we look at defiance. So these are some of the characteristics. And she's going to, in this, uh, in this book, she looks at addiction uh, with drugs, with tobacco and with alcoholism. And in the following slides, what she does is she um, identifies the causes for each one of these addictions. And I'm going to skip these slides, uh, um, but if you can look at the slide, you see that I have put in bold some of the main emotions for each one of them, such as being frightened, such as fear of life, such as lacking tolerance to deal with uh, frustrations. Here, uh, she says, people are looking for an escape from reality due to the distressing rules and regulations 
that they feel they must be denied or extinguished at any uh, price. When we're looking, when talking about tobacco, right? Uh, she's gonna talk about shyness. She's gonna talk about fear, complex of inferiority, insecurity. She talks about low self-esteem and anxiety. All, again, we're looking at feelings, we're looking at emotions that are behind one's needs for um, these um, resources, right? Alcoholism, anxiety plays a preponderant part in the use of alcohol due to the illusion that its ingestion calms and produces happiness, which does not correspond uh, to um, reality. So whether we're speaking about depression or whether we're speaking about drugs and addiction, when we look at the, the definition of health, given to us by the spirit Emano, it has to do with our connection with God. So when we look at diseases, diseases come, the primary disease that our humanity has is its disconnection uh, from God. It is the moment that God is no longer a reference for us and we become our own references. And life here on earth becomes our own uh, reference. And our worth, instead of being from the awareness of who we are as children of God, becomes now about all the values and all the things that pertain to the material realm. So our worth is on how young we are, on how strong we are, how successful we are, um, right? So how many titles we have, how many things we possess. So I believe that this is the great source of illness that we experience in this level of consciousness that we are right now in this planet. The main reason for all the disorders and diseases that we witness come from the disconnection uh, from God. We lose sight of what we are truly about, we lose sight of what life is truly about, and our when when that happens, our idea of happiness becomes very murky. We 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 when we are disconnected from God, it's just like it's just like walking through life as if we were walking through a very 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 foggy day. You can't see well. You can't see what is right in front of you, and that's how we live in general, right? Our vision is very blurry because we have lost connection with God. And now we believe that happiness is truly where happiness isn't. And therefore we set ourselves to many frustrations and uh, many difficulties. So when we are uh, dealing with the issues of, uh, of uh, drugs, we're looking we're looking at ways of creating artificial happiness. Now, I, want, I would like to take a little pause here and bring to our attention, all of us, that perhaps you're not someone who has ever experienced depression. Perhaps you're not someone who you would call addicted. But I want to tell you that this lecture belongs to you and to me as much as it belongs to everybody else. Because the primary disease is one that's common to all of us. Therefore, we are all um, prone to experience depression. We are all, because we are all, all rebellious beings. And the issue of addiction and the issue of suicide, it's also an issue that belongs to all of us. And I want to make a point about that in the rest of the time uh, that I have. Because it's easy to think I'm not addicted, so she's not speaking to me. Or I don't think about suicide, she's not speaking to me. But I am, I am. Because those are uh, 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 escape routes that we take. Uh, drugs in addiction, we seek to create uh, a fake state of happiness and 
this is something that we all do as humans in one way or another. And suicide, although we don't uh, seek necessarily to live our lives um, concretely, we all do so. We all take escape routes from reality. It's very, very difficult for us to be fully present with who we are at all moments. So these issues belong to, to, to all of us. So what happens is with, with drugs and, and, and with uh, uh, addiction is what Joanna talks here. When a patient first starts to use toxic chemicals and after the false euphoria and the fall into distress due to lack of artificial stimulus, quite often the person feels deeply uneasy and not well. So what happens is we are disconnected. We want to be happy. We can't take the discomfort. We can't deal with the sadness. We can't manage life. Life is not what we want. It's not what we expect, right? And now I want to feel better. So I am going to take a first sip of wine. I am going to open a beer. I'm going to have my whiskey. Whatever it is that you're going to do, you're escaping the unpleasant sensation of that moment, that discomfort right? But what happens is instead of processing, instead of dealing, you numb, you postpone, and then you wake up the next day and the problem, guess what? Didn't go anywhere. It's right there with you, probably added uh, of more complexity and, and, and uh, challenges. So I also love this picture because um, it. Um, Yes, it, when you look at it, you know, it's a very powerful uh, image of, um, of this emptiness that characterizes um, the majority of, of people, how people feel. And so, again, we start very little. No one starts drinking a bottle of wine, for example, in the first time you try a wine, very rarely. Right, unless you're 15 you know, in, a, in a party with teenagers. But otherwise, you have a glass. And then you have two glasses, right? And then soon you are uh, drinking more and more. And so what's happening here? Is there an increase in the use of substance gradually? And I would say no. What there is is an increase in the inner hole that requires more and more drugs to fuel the emptiness within. So we are not necessarily increasing the dosage, it's that the dosage or whatever it is that we're ingesting, whatever it is that we are doing, it's not taking care of what needs to take care, to be taken care of. Therefore, the emptiness becomes bigger. The hole becomes bigger. Therefore, one glass is no longer enough to numb and to fuel that hole in that moment. Now you need two. Tomorrow you need a bottle. And therefore, you keep going, increasing, increasing, increasing a cycle that is a cycle of destruction and a cycle that is a cycle of death. So Joanna is going to tell us that, you know, many heart addicts are victims of the same habit that they had in previous existence, in which they dove into the deep abyss and came back with the marks of the dependence that consumed them, carrying forward into future serious issues that need to be atoned for. So a lot of times, people who uh, end up going into addiction, as she's saying right here, are people who have had actually the same experience very much uh, with suicide. With suicide, people who commit suicide many times, they have been suicidal in other uh, uh, lives, and it's very common that this repeats. At that same time of the life of the spirit, let's say 40 years of age or whatever that might be, it's as if that memory comes back and the person feels uh, the impulse uh, to commit suicide again. So that's what Joanna is talking about here. Each less dignified habit acquired by the soul 
in the incessant course of the centuries, function as a living entity in the universe of feelings, compelling the individual to disturb regions and offering elements of connection with inferior spirits. This is from Missionaries of the Light. So these behaviors, these uh, tendencies, these way of living, these patterns of behavior unhealthy, they, they don't stay in the past, as uh, the spirits are saying here. They, they are living entity. They are playing a role. They are alive within us. And they, a lot of times, will also attract spirits who are going to, as we mentioned before, enhance and power this process. So we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the spiritual influences here. And I brought a few examples from the literature of uh, Andrew Lewis to, um, to uh, illustrate what we are talking about. So he's the family um, made up of a, of a widow, three children, and an elderly couple that's sitting around a diner table in front of a very simple lunch. It's the description of the book. However, phenomena that I had never seen before mirrored my observation. This is Andrew Lewis narrating. Six spirits enveloped in a shadow joined them at the meal as if they were taking nourishment by absorption. So this is just to remind us that, again, we are never alone, and there is a spiritual component uh, to the addictions, as we are going to see here in this explanation. And Andrew Lewis' mentor is going to say to him, are you so surprised at seeing them taking food only by inhaling it? What about us? Are you perchance unaware of the fact that incarnate humans receive more than 70% of the normal nourishment through atmospheric elements collected by means of respiratory channels. You know that substances cooked by fire undergo profound disintegration. So here is the mentor explaining how is it that the spirits, they are sharing the same energy, the same uh, nourishment while the incarnates are eating, the discarnates are always are also absorbing those energies, the nourishment through the air. <clears throat> well, our friends who are addicted to physiological sensations find such disintegrated elements the same flavors they use to experience when in the flesh. And then this is another case, the case of Claudio Nogueira and um, talks about the power of suggestion. Two unfortunate discarnates approach Claudio unceremoniously. So Claudio is incarnated. Drink, my friend, need a drink. I need a drink. The spirit says, I need a drink. Claudio could not hear a single sound. He went on reading undisturbed. Nevertheless, when his, if his physical eardrums had not registered the order, his mental wave band was attuned to the intruder. So mind to mind, they were attuned in the same wavelength. The inappropriate guest repeated the order several times like a hypnotist who wants an order to obey. The result was not long in coming. The man stopped reading the political editorial that has engrossed him so much. He could not explain his sudden lack of interest. Claudia finally accepted the suggestion. Convinced that he felt like having a shot of whiskey solely for himself. He wanted to calm down. The cunning uninvited guest perceived that his victim had given into the suggestion and latched on to him. A light touch at first, then an enveloped embrace, followed by a full embrace and reciprocal association. Both of them were integrated with each other in a perfect, extraordinary example of fluidic grafting. Claudia the man was absorbing the discarnate like a shoe adjusting to a foot. They melded with each other as if they were going to inhabit one body. They stood up at the same time and turned around in the small space, totally integrated, to pick up the bottle. The first gulp rolled down the throat, both simultaneously smacked the lips in pleasure. I approach Carlos in order to impartially investigate how extensively he was mentally enduring the process of fusion. 
I could see right away that he remained free inwardly. He was not experiencing any kind of torment as he yielded. He merely hosted the discarnate and willingly accepted his guidance. There was no symbiosis in which he was the victim. There was only implicit association, a natural mixing. The experience was based on percussion, appeal and response, all strings absolutely in tune. The discarnate suggested, the incarnate agreed. The former requested, the latter conceded. I think this case is absolutely amazing and it's in Sex and Destiny, chapter six. And it's amazing because we like to think about obsession as this subtle, um, continuous process, um, you know, that again, a spirit, a discarnate is responsible, we are the victims. And this case illustrates so well, like, First, several concepts, and I recommend the book Life and Thought by Emano if you want to understand all the concepts that are described here. But um, Mental Wave was a tune, so um, they were in the same wavelength, very much like when you tune your radio to a certain station, that's what happens. The, the person drinking, right? He accepted this suggestion. He wasn't coerced. He wasn't forced. He just said, sure. Just like an invitation, let's go to this, sure. So he just went along. He wanted to calm down. Let's think about that. My dear friends, how many of us at the end of the day want to calm down? I'm going to ask you, what do you do to calm down at the end of each day? Right? And this is a personal question. Each person, this is not a judgmental question. We're here not to judge. We're here to invite people to reflect. And we all go, listen, I said, this belongs to all of us, myself included. I am looking at myself. How am I escaping life each day? What is it that I am doing to avoid being with my own feelings? What drugs, what substances are you, I'm using or not, right? Sometimes it's not a substance. Sometimes it's a behavior. Sometimes I cannot be present. So I need to be on social media all the time because I can bear my own feelings. So when we realize that we too are doing those things, it's easier to understand somebody else who perhaps come with a greater level of addiction in our way. That person, that person that is escaping, that is escaping life, that person that is escaping the present moment, that person that is escaping his own, own feelings, is not that different than you and I. We are all doing the same thing, but we do it different ways and we do it at different levels. But it is important that we help someone else by being brave and courageous and present with our own feelings and with our own reality. So moving forward with our slides, we're gonna go back here. So he remained freely inward, right? And we go back now to the very uh, first definition of Ivana Giangio. Happiness is unchained by the harmony experienced by the spirit, the pleasant feeling of a duty that has been fulfilled, moral righteousness, which allows within the brain the production of dopamine and other similar substances. So the question is, how do we get there, right? How do we reach healing without escaping. So I want to bring to you the concept of Andrew Lewis and the three levels of uh, the house um, that he talks about um, being the first level, the, the basement of the house where lies uh, our unconscious, our uh, impulses, our habits, our uh, tendencies. So this is the most primitive areas of our uh, brain, our lower brain, so to speak. Um, sorry. Run. Then we have the first floor, the cortex, where is um, the present moment, our current acquisitions. And then we have um, the second floor, which is basically the prefrontal cortex, which corresponds to our superconscious. It is our ideals, our higher goals, and the future, 
what we envision for ourselves. So since depression, since addiction is an organic entity that requires uh, treatment by our, uh, our um, doctors, um, uh, the, the, the resources, the science, but it also is a spiritual issue. We're gonna look at the brain and the mind and these three levels to think about healing, understanding that our primitive brain is responsible for our past, is where all our experiences are. The first floor is responsible for the present moment and is where um, the, the inhabitants of the first floor are effort and will. And the second floor, the inhabitant is our ideals, is our goal. So whether we're talking about depression or addiction, um, we are, I'm gonna skip that slide. We are, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can please repeat it. Okay. So we have to act on all levels of our, uh, our brain. So when Jesus says reconcile quickly with your adversary, our adversary, our enemy is a lot of times these personalities, these feelings, these emotions that are in our unconscious or our habits or our tendencies that we don't like and we rather not feel, we rather not deal with them. But Jesus did recommend the importance of reconciliation with the adversary. And usually we're thinking of these adversaries outside of ourselves, but we realize at this point in our lives that they live within. So the first part for healing is to make peace with yourself, with your own feelings. It's to be courageous, to look at, it's courageous to be peace, to make peace. I'm still this way. I'm you know, I'm having difficulty to accept. Okay, let me let me understand this. Let me make peace by understanding, by having a conversation with my own feelings. On the second, on the first floor, it's the present moment. So it is what Paul says to us: "All things are lawful to me, but not all things are beneficial." So we understand. We make peace with who we are, right? Now we can make choices. I still cannot change my nature. I still have all these feelings. They're not gonna change from one day to another. They don't change automatically just because I understood them. But now I am conscious of what my feelings and emotions are and I can choose consciously how I am going to manage my life. So although I want to do this, although I want to use this, a drug or whatever that might be, I choose to be awakened. I choose to be alive. I choose to stand still and not run away from my own self. I choose to face my fears. I choose to hurt knowing that I will come out of it better, stronger. So now in the present moment through discipline, effort and will, we can make a different, a different present for ourselves. But we cannot do this without activating the second floor of our home, of our mind, by saying, I can do everything through him who strengthens me. So understanding that there are times where none of these is going to work. We're going to feel like that although we are trying to reconcile with ourselves, we're putting our best effort in the moment, we're still so incredibly frail that the only strength that we can gather is the strength of reconnecting with the source of all power in the universe, which is God. So we reconnect with Jesus, we reconnect with God, with the good spirits, with your guardian angel, with a higher power than you that can give you the strength that you need, that can help you in building the virtues, in having the vision. It's important to know where you're going. A lot of times we don't see but the present moment, having a vision, seeing the future, believing that a better day is gonna come, being certain of the future, help us to find strength in the moments that many times we don't seem to find. 
And Joanna Johnson is going to say, at this time of disorders of varying denomination, the therapy of the gospel is the most valuable without any demerit for the others for providing a joy, hope of fulfillment and guideline for self enlightenment. So when we look at happiness, we summarize saying that, you know, happiness, it's important that we learn to be sad. It's important that we acknowledge without judgment all our emotions. It's important that we understand who we are. It's important that we understand the value of the present moment. And it's absolutely important that we seek connection with God, understanding again that the primary illness of our humanity can, comes precisely from the disconnection. Okay, we have 20 minutes and I am going to close inviting us then to choose life, to choose to live. And again, this is an entire lecture of more than one hour, so I'm gonna skip some of the slides, but we do have um, severe, a significant increase in the rate of suicides in the United States. And there are many statistics that you can uh, look at, um, but you know, what is important is to think a little bit who is the suicidal individual. And Joana de Angelis is going to define by saying, it is someone who lives a process of disconnection characterized by the development of immediate and materialistic ideas followed by feelings of victimization and lack of responsibility and power that makes the person believe that death is the best option. So ultimately someone who has lost the address of him or herself. The risk factors are psychiatric disorders, drugs, depression, alcohol. In fact, alcohol has been linked to one out of five uh, suicides that we see uh, happening. A lot of time, uh, feelings of uh, losses, uh, whether material, financial, uh, chronic uh, pain, chronic illnesses, family history. And then you have social uh, aspects such as wars or uh, migration, discrimination, trauma, isolation, all of those are risk factors. Some of the common feelings um, similar to depression, hopelessness, loneliness, despair, low self-esteem, inadequacy, scarcity, excessive concern, impulsivity, amb amb ambivalence, a low threshold for uh, frustration. So I put the sentence there, are these feelings unknown to you? So these are feelings again, that we all feel, that we all experience, and they are difficult for us to uh, deal with. <clears throat> Let's see my, my next slide, give me a second. Okay, so I just want to, uh, bring to you that, um, you know, when we look at the natural laws, we have uh, two laws uh, that we find within the natural laws, the law of conservation and the law of destruction. The law of conservation, um, both laws apply to both material life and the spiritual life. And the law of conservation is basically what help, helps us to uh, choose life, right? Um, it's, helps us to preserve uh, our life. The law of destruction is also a law of nature and it's a law that is present uh, to, for the necessary renovation, for the necessary transformation and the betterment of all things. So it's a law of nature, although when destruction happens, that's all that we see, destruction. The spirits explain to us that what we call destruction is actually renewal is transformation, has this purpose of the betterment of all things. You might be thinking, why is Susanna talking about law of conservation and destruction, right? So when we go to the gospel, according to spiritism, there is this um, uh, part about um, melancholy that talks. 
Do you know why a vague sadness sometimes weighs upon your heart to make you find life so bitter? It is your spirit which aspires to happiness and freedom and which bound to the body that serves as its prison exhausts itself in vain efforts to escape. However, seeing that such efforts are useless, it falls into despondency and the body bearing the spirit's influence sluggishness, dejection, and a kind of apathy seizes you and you find yourself unhappy. So here it's really interesting because the spirits are telling us that our spirits, they, they wish to go back home. They wish to go back to their real environment. We leave the illusion that this is the real. This is not the real. The real is our real home, is our spiritual home. So it is natural that we have this aspiration. And sometimes we do feel tired, don't we? We do feel like fatigue of leaving. And there is this aspiration for a life that's not so heavy, that's lighter. The spirits will continue by saying, believe me and strongly resist this feeling that weaken your willpower. The yearnings for a better life are innate in the human, in the spirit of all humans but do not seek it in this world. And nowadays, as God is sending his spirits to instruct you about the divine happiness reserved for you, patiently await the angel of deliverance who will help you break the bonds that hold your spirit captive. Remember that during your trial on earth, you have a mission that you cannot doubt, whether in dedicating yourself to your family or whether fulfilling the various obligations that God has entrusted you. So here they make it clear, yes, this aspiration for freedom is there, but you got to resist and wait for the right time for deliverance because you have a mission. We all have a mission. The person who is lying in bed, completely paralyzed, that only moves their eyes, has a mission. The mission of that person sometimes is to bear witness of what it is to undergo a life of such a trial with patience, resignation, and acceptance. And a lot of times these folks are modeling something that we are so resistant to do with very little struggles and trials relatively comparing to that person. So we all have a mission to fulfill. If during the course of this trial and while performing a task, you see worries, troubles, and vexations fall upon you, be strong and courageous in order to bear them. Face them resolutely. They are of short duration and will lead you to friends for whom you weep. They will rejoice at your arrival amongst them and will extend their arms to you to lead you to a place where afflictions of earth have no access. So here is the consolation part of spiritism telling us, listen, you are struggling. Hang in there. This is of short duration. I know, I understand it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it's forever, but that is when spiritism comes to us and does what's written in the gospel, takes us to the higher, to the top of the mountain, enlarges our view of our lifetime, puts this lifetime into the perspective of our evolution, and then we understand that indeed this time is a short time. And if we endure courageously, when we pass at the right time, will be granted the joy, the happiness of being with our loved ones and moving to places where less and less suffering has access to. So Jesus the Cruz brings this uh, idea of recycling of life. And um, he talks about life recycles itself to the transformation of matter that recycles itself or to inner transformation with the recycling of our values. So here, I want to bring to you the idea that, you know, although we're talking about choosing life and the idea of suicide, in order to choose life, we need to understand that life is made of many, many incarnations in one lifetime. And a lot of times what we are called to do is to die a little bit each day to be reborn the next day a little stronger. This is what Carlos Pastorino also tells us. 
when he says that reincarnation has as a goal the development of the inner God, but spiritual resurrection is the most efficient process for inner enlightenment. And with that, my dear friends, the idea is that we all need to learn to die a little bit each day in order to be born again the next day. This is life, life is movement. And humans resist movement. Humans want to keep everything in one place. They are comfortable with stagnation. But life, to be alive, to be alive in life is necessary to embrace movement and to embrace change. So Paxlovino is going to say, in each resurrection, which is the equivalent of transitioning from darkness to the light of self-awareness, ignorance is overcome, knowledge is gained, and a step is taken in the direction of wholeness and peace. So here again, Pastorino is highlighting for us the idea that resurrection, resurrection in a lifetime, there will be moments where we'll feel that parts of us are dying and that's necessary because it's the trimming that we were talking about back then in depression. It is when we take advantage of our feelings and we let go of certain things, we let go of certain part of, of us that no longer serve us behaviors, and it feels like that. But believe me, you will wake up the next day or the next moment stronger, even more alive. So it is in our ability to bear these moments of grief, of darkness, of loss, understanding that something better is gonna come our way. I love this shirt. This is my, my uh, shirt from work, Movement is Medicine. And it's the back of the t-shirt. I'm a physical therapist. And I take that literally, not only uh, physically speaking, but also uh, spiritually and emotionally speaking. We have to move. Movement heals. Stagnation produces illness. No one grows with stagnation, so it's important to move. When we wish someone a happy new year, I know it's not January 1st, but I did keep this slide over there, right? What is it that we usually wish to people? We wish that they have a year that's like a vacation in Bahia, Brazil, or <laughs> some place where there's a beautiful beach in the Bahamas, a beautiful beach with a, a hammock between two coconut trees, and that your ear is filled with joy, happiness, preferably no pain, no suffering. Um, everything stays the same or better. You're going to achieve all your material success. And this is usually what we mean when we wish Happy New Year to someone. What if from now on we wish each other a Happy New Year filled with growth, filled with happiness, but also with moments where we can grow, we can experience a little bit of sadness and why not? Not that we're going to seek for sadness, but we're going to seek for growth. We're going to seek for authenticity. We're going to seek for uh, honesty, emotional honesty. We're going to um, wish courage. We're going to wish a year filled with meaningful moments, moments of learning, moments of growth that ultimately will lead to happiness. This is from the book, The Presence uh, Process, that says our willingness to consciously engage our imprinted discomfort is the alchemy that fuels transformation. I love this sentence. Our willingness to consciously engage our imprinted discomfort is the alchemy that fuels transformation. Um, he's going to continue by saying the present process is the battleground of emotional warriors. This work, the work of being present in each day, in each moment, with each emotion, isn't about being easy or good. It's about becoming authentic, going up emotionally. It's about grasping life intimately with both hands and raising ourselves up from being emotionally dead. I feel particularly emotional right now, I must say, in reading this and perhaps speaking here for two hours. Um, but the point with this slide is this. Some people take their lives um, by having a very drastic um, 
action where they take away their physical life. But there's so many people living out there, apparently alive, who are truly dead. They are alive in the body and they are so dead emotionally. They are so dead spiritually. My question to you is, are you taking advantage of this incredible, incredible, beautiful, precious moment called present? No matter where you are, who you are, what are your feelings? If you are having a sunny or a cloudy or a rainy day, do you understand the importance of this present moment? Are you alive? Are you awakening? Are you present? Are you taking advantage of this moment to grow, to live? I think of Lazarus when he was taken back from death to life by Jesus. He was born again. That's what we need to do each day. We need to come out of our death. We need to be alive. We need to be present. The most important thing that happens to Lazarus that day is not that he came back to physical life. It's that he was given an opportunity to rethink his whole life. He was given an opportunity to live truly, fully, wholly, embracing life from a different perspective because he was dead and now he was alive. So if you were dead, it's time for you to resurrect. It's time for you to come back to life. And how can we tell people, how can we judge people when they take their lives if we are not living our lives fully ourselves, if we are seeking to escape? At the end of each day, because we can bear the frustrations of our day or of our sadness, of like uh, Michael Brown says here, the discomfort of being human. The task granted to our hearts is not for it to feel better, but it is for it to become better at feeling. This is, my dear friends, the 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 homework that I'm going to leave for you all today as we speak of depression, as we speak of addictions or suicide. The task is not for us to feel better. The task is for us to become better at feeling. At the very core of everything is our ability to, to sit with our feelings. And again, I sound repetitive, but it's actually so difficult to do this. It takes so much courage to be able to sit quietly and embrace who you are. So my my proposal is that, again, that we seek to live our lives fully, that we seek to embrace the present moment. And it is easier to do so when we have clear in our minds the meaning of our lives, the meaning of our pains, the meaning of our sufferings, the meaning of uh, the obstacles and the trials that we undergo each day. And he is where spiritism is a precious resource, instrument, body of knowledge, philosophy. The gospel is the good news that Jesus brought to all of us. The gospel explains to us what Jesus had to say. It gives us the meaning of life. We understand who we are. We understand where we came from. We understand where we're going. We understand the reasons why we are living everything that we are living. And when we understand that, not with our minds, but with our hearts, we just want to embrace life. I know that life sometimes is very, very, very difficult. I know that I feel, sometimes I feel a little inadequate speaking about those things because the level of pain and misery that's out there is so immense. And it's difficult to talk about things that I cannot empathize with because you can only empathize with the things that you have truly, truly undergone yourself. So understand that I am not saying that any of these things is easy. And I don't know the size of your pain and I don't intend to to be able to tell anyone what is 
the best thing for them to do. But I can say from my own personal experience within spiritualism that there is a purpose for everything. There is a purpose for everything that we live, that we are not victims of anything. And the life is giving us at this moment exactly, exactly what we need in order to experience finally this happiness that we have been wanting so much, seeking so much. It's not by escaping the present moment, it's not by escaping our physical lives that we'll get there because life has no end. We are immortal beings. There is only, only life in the universe. We are always, always alive, whether in the physical body, whether outside of the physical body, there is only life. How do you want to live your life? How do you want your present moment or your future moment to, do, to be? Do you want to be happy? If you want to be happy, it's important for you to be awake and to be as alive as possible in the present moment. And when everything else fails, remember to pray. Remember to open your heart and your mind to the higher source of life. And believe me, your prayers will always be heard. And God will always answer your prayers. You will be brought the intuition. You will be brought the strength. You will be brought ideas. People will come into your life, messages, a book, a sign, something will come. The resources that you seem to lack, sometimes they are on your way. If you just wait one more day, you will see that the solution is going to come. But remember, the real life is the life of the spirit and everything that we are living here is temporary. It will pass. These two shall pass. I can do everything in the one who sustains me today and tomorrow. So thank you so much for this time. And I'm going to pass back to Leo. Susanna, thank you so much um, for this moment. I always like to remind everyone that uh, we're not only thanking you, but also your family members, your partner, your kids. Uh, the moment that you <laughs> take um, from your personal lives, we could all be doing different things, right? But you choose, you chose life. You chose to be here with us, giving us this amazing um, information uh, through Spiritism, as well as um, uh, giving the, the these homework that you know to to feel alive, to get connected with one another. So thank you for all of it. We send our good vibrations to you, to your family members, and to your home as well. So thank you. And this thank is in name of everyone who also, you're welcome, that, that you know, connected with us with uh, today, um, who who said their, their, their highs here, um, who is excited to have you here as well. So uh, in the name of everyone, we say thank you. I would like to um, um, give the, the space and time for our dear friend Abigail and Leah um, to say something, to ask a question if you have a question, then what we'll do is to start sharing the questions that um, came up um, um, that you posted um, online for, with us. I will try to um, skip the hellos, the welcomes and everything yeah. um, so we can actually go straight into the uh, meat and potato, which is important to us, right? So um, for, um, Abigail, please, um, if you would like to say and ask a question, we'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, Susanna, darling, no words to thank you so very much for this wonderful teaching to us today. Um, I was a very, uh, I'm sure for a lot of us, a lot of to review and a lot of to apply. And please know my, my gratitude and may God bright our way always. And I hope in a future, a near future, to have you back with the other topics of, uh, of us. I'm going to have just a, a quick question in how to deal with frustrations when that is caused misbehavior of others. I'm sorry, um, how to deal with frustrations? I missed the second part. It's a little choppy. How to deal with frustration? When that How is caused do, by misbehavior. Leo, 
Yes, the question is how to deal with frustrations when that is caused by the misbehaviors of others. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Frustrations come always from um, uh, expectations that we have of people's behaviors. So usually the problem is ours, is on our expectations. Um, we expect from others sometimes uh, what they are not ready yet to give. We believe they are. That's our problem. They are not. I mean, we are also, um, sometimes we have uh, expectations with ourselves and we get frustrated when we can't deliver it. That's because we thought of ourselves as being more than we actually are or perhaps having acquired and um, solidify some virtues that we have not. Um, so it's really a problem with our, our, the way we are relating to someone else. Um, let's remember that we only have power of our own behavior and actions, right? We cannot control people's behaviors, but we can control how we react to their behaviors. And again, the same way we feel frustrated with others, I think we get, I don't know, I, I once in a while, I'm like, I can't believe I did this, you know? And so that's, I'm frustrated with myself. And I realized that I was placing myself in a, in a place that I'm truly not there yet. There's still learning to be done. So as you become better at managing your frustrations with yourself and you understand your own humanity, you also become more compassionate towards others. And you understand that if someone is disappointing you, it was your problem in the first place to put that person in a place where she or he is not quite yet there. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, uh, and, and thank you, Abigail, for this amazing question. Uh, just to highlight on that real quick, um, you mentioned this book earlier today too, Susanna, on the book um, Thought in Life. Um, there is a great explanation about this idea on how we deal with the ideas of others. So it just came to mind uh, because it's mm -hmm. a very dear book to me as well. So um, uh, as, as I was thinking, Abigail's question is not only her question, but many of ours. Uh, we always deal with this um, transitional moments, let's call it that way, for us to keep it more in a sensitive way. Um, next, Leah, do you have any questions, any comments that you'd like to make? Yes, first of all, thank you so much, Susanna. You really uh, you know, you spoke to our hearts, to our souls, and uh, so much learning, so many food for thought here, reflections. And if you can um, sum summarize um, in a few words, how can spiritism really help us? What kind of tools we can use, you know, to um, really improve ourselves and deal with our own frustrations, addictions, and sadness? Maybe you need two more hours, but uh, just a little summary for us. I think it come. I think what spiritism does is. I think it goes back to um, the last my the last thing that I was talking about. Right. What spiritism does is um, gives us the meaning of life. The meaning of life um, in the perspective of immortality but also the meaning of what is the purpose of our life here in the present moment. I think that um, it's difficult for us to I mean, you know, you were, it is our disconnection from God. 
So I think that uh, the philosophy of spiritism by presenting the meaning of life helps us to reconnect with God. That's what we need to do, to reconnect with what is real. We are disconnected. We are, our values are in the wrong place. Our identification with matter is very, very strong. Materialism remains our biggest enemy. Even now, even with the spiritism, <laughs> I like to say that we are, we, for, before we were materialists, now we are spiritualist materialists. One day we'll be spiritualists only. We're in transition, like Leo said. We believe that in, in spirits. We believe in the spiritual life, but our, our values are so much, so tied in with the material realm. So for example, aging. Aging is very, very, very difficult for many of us because our value has been placed on the material body. So when our material bodies start to fail on us, right, and we can't do anymore the way we used to, can't produce anymore the way we, we did, we feel that our worth has also decreased. I, I tell this little story, and I don't mean to deviate so much, but um, I think that, you know, that's what spiritism gives us. And, and that's what we are trying to grasp still. We have it cognitively but we don't have it yet uh, emotionally uh, in our guts. And that's the work that needs to be done, right? But I know a spiritist person who, spiritist like president of center, right? So someone who like very, that when this person turned 65 years of age, she lives in Brazil, she had to take the public transportation and she said to me, the first day I had to take the public transportation, the bus, they told me, the driver told me, your, your ticket is half of the price because now you were 65. And she said to me, I hated that because in that moment I felt that I value half as well. And although that is a, a little bit of an extreme situation, I think it speaks very much to the way that we feel and how we identify to the physical body and how our value is in how our body looks, how a young our body is, you know what I mean? So, on and on and on. But the point being what spiritism does, it, you are a child of God. This is what the values that really matter. This is what happiness means, you know, and it helps us to, it helps us, it, it, it keeps us on track. It helps us to, 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 to not lose sight of what is really important. It gives us hope. You can be crushed in pain, but you never lose hope because once you have the meaning of life, it's like, you can be in the darkest of the night, but when you look up for one second, you see a light on the sky. There is a star that never goes away. That star is the light of knowledge, is the light of understanding, is the light of meaning. So you can be in pit darkness, but that little star is always there reminding you of what life is truly about and giving you hope for you, there's always hope for you, no matter who you are, no matter how bad you feel about yourself, there's always hope for you. If there's hope for you, there's hope for humanity. There's hope for all of us. And so that is the biggest contribution of spiritism is to give life meaning and to give each one of us hope. Thank you, Susanna, very powerful words. Um, um and we would like to continue with some of the questions that we have now here and I'll move on quickly to um, Yasko uh, Arakava said in sadness will we and therapists more able to recognize the cause as compared to depression that may be multifactorial well sadness can be pretty multifactorial itself 
uh, like I said, you know, I think the example that I gave was pretty, you know, illustrated that concept because um, when you were grieving, for example, and you were sad, there are so many feelings that go into that sadness. So it can be difficult to, uh, to identify also what are all the elements that are, you know, underneath the sadness. Now, that being said, of course, depression is, a, you know, it's a step further. Um, it is when sadness doesn't flow, right, like the river, and it gets um, blocked or not attended to, then now you have this overflow of, uh, of sadness because it didn't flow. Like the idea of the river was that the emotions need to flow. They need to pass. They need to be acknowledged. They need to be transcended. When we ignore them, then they become this, this immense force that takes us down in the case of depression. So depression is a little... Um, uh, you know, a little bit more complex. Um, one idea that I like it um, with the, this idea of emotions in the river. So, for example, if you uh, if you lose a, a, a loved one, it's time to grieve. You need to stop. You need to 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 feel. We need to allow time for the healing process to take place. In our society, in American society particularly we um, go back to work very quickly. It's great to work because now you don't think anymore. You have to work, you, you, you distract your mind. So, okay, you go back to work. You have this idea that you heal, that you, you, you grieve the time that you had to grieve, right? Now, two months later, your bird dies, right? And you find yourself in a level of grief that is unspeakable. All right. Okay, you had attachment to the bird. It was your little bird. And, but people may look at you and say, this is not proportional. But understand that now you're grieving the bird and your parent that died a couple months ago and you didn't grieve properly. So the grieving of the, the death of the bird now triggers all the grieving and all the, the issues of another death that was not properly grieved. And so as we block our emotions, eventually they overflow when they are triggered again. But now you don't have just the loss of your bird, the loss of your bird, the loss of your parent, the loss of a job that was important to you and was not properly grieved, and all many, many losses that were not grieved properly. And then you end up into depression. So that's how it becomes even more complicated with depression. I hope I, I answer your question. Um, but the main point is that even sadness can be multifactorial in the sense that um, it doesn't have necessarily the organic component or, you know, but it's always spiritual, right? I, I, sometimes we, we break things in, in different parts just to be a little bit more didactic. But every single emotion has a spiritual component and a psychological component and sometimes end up with an organic component. So you can have sadness that end up manifesting in your body in the form of tension, back pain, for example. And you go to the doctor to treat back pain, but really what you have is sadness that is not um, acknowledged. And now you put in the garbage of the body, which I like to say that our backs are the garbage disposal of our body, any emotion that we don't want to deal with or you don't want to see, we throw in the back. And that's why humanity suffers from back pain. Everybody has back pain one time or another in their lifetimes because that's the place where we throw all the emotions that we don't want to deal with. Now, that's the physical therapist speaking. <laughs> Thank you again, Susanna. Uh, amazing comments. Um, I would like to actually show one comment that Kirsten, and then we're going to go to the, the question that she made on, on top of that. To be honest, Sue, the only place I feel supported and comfortable sharing my humanity are in mommy, in, the, in my mommy support groups uh, rather than randomly on Facebook. I think that many people feel the same. And then she asked, how can we engender 
such a change when our very hu nature, human nature, is judgmental at times, even within the spiritist arena? Yes, yeah, true, Kirsten. Um, most people don't feel, and I don't think honestly that Facebook is the proper platform to share our, um, you know, most uh, intimate uh, struggles. Uh, it's not the place. Some people do, and it's a little disturbing. <laughs> but um, the point with the, the Facebook is just that it just creates this illusion, you know, of, of, of happiness. Um, my point was not that we should be sharing our frailties there, but it's just that we have to take it carefully, uh, especially our young, um, our youth uh, that believes that everything that they see there is real when really isn't. And the young starts feeling so inadequate because they are not, what their friends are posting on Facebook, it's harder for them to differentiate. It's hard for us. I mean, sometimes I look and I, I, I mean, I don't know you, but I'm gonna share my humanity. Sometimes I look at what some people are doing and traveling, I'm like, I'm so envious. I'm like, oh my God, these people are doing all these things, you know, and you believe, you end up believing that that's really what their life is about. So if we who are, I like to think uh, mature adults, you know, with some awareness, uh, fall into the trap of social media and believe that people are living their lives like, you know, then, you know, the young become extremely, extremely vulnerable uh, with these um, uh, ideas. So that's the, the, the thing about um, the platforms. Now, as far as uh, what you said in terms of, um, you know, finding places. I think that that's a process. I think that spiritism is evolving. I think that the whole contribution of Joana de Angelis and today we have a number, a number of speakers in the medical field who are psychologists, who are psychiatrists, or like myself, neither one of them, just very bold, <laughs> talking about feelings, talking about emotions, interested, in this aspect of uh, spirituality, I think that this is um, the journey. You know, I think we are slowly, we're gonna slowly get there. I did the talk that I did for the Spiritual Symposium um, this year. I'm, I'm, yeah, I think it was this year uh, where I talk about um, the phenomena of otherization which is, um, you know, to see others as different than me and then realize that all these others that I see outside and that I dislike, they actually live within me. And um, that's the work that I need to do. The more that I can embrace the others within me, that I'll be able to embrace the others outside of me. Um, I think that's the way to go. We're gonna get there. I think we need a spiritual movement that's uh, more humane, more compassionate, more authentic. Um, and and you know what can we do? We can we, we can do starting from ourselves. I mean, I try within you know uh, reason to share my humanity. When I do my talks, it's not that I promote myself. I don't try to speak about myself too much. But I do share, I like to share my struggles, I like to share my difficulties um, so that people can see and they can um, understand that I'm not talking here, I didn't talk this afternoon about the things that I do. I did talk about the things that I aspire to do. It's important that people understand that. So a lot of times we get frustrated going back to Abigail's comment with people in the spiritualist movement because we hold them responsible for leaving everything that they are saying. Understand they're not talking about the things that they are doing. They're talking about the things that they aspire to do and the beings that they aspire to be. So if we understand that a little bit better in our hearts, I think we'll be able to promote and create spaces there where I really, let me say something very, very, 
very personal. There is nothing able to be myself. So it's such a source of joy to be able to be authentic, to be able to be you and, and speak about your talents and about your limitations and about who you love and, and your reality. I feel very alive. It's very free. It's very good. It would be nice if everybody could feel the same way. Not that I don't have limitations and moments where I hold back and I, I choose not to disclose out of fear, sometimes out of shame. Uh, but, you know, at this moment in my life, I can say that I am very comfortable with who I am. And I wish that to everyone. I wish that the spirits movement we, would allow people because I think that we can be in a spiritual center. We can be here with hundreds and hundreds of people and still be so incredibly lonely. And this is one of the biggest, biggest factors in depression and suicide. People are lonely. They need to feel that they are not alone, that people are there for them, to hold hands with them and to walk this life together. Thank you, Susanna. We will, because of time, folks, we will share the final question. One final question here. It's very pertinent to this talk as well. And then we'll say a couple things um, here at the end and we'll pray uh, so we can finalize it. But uh, from Viviani Marilla, um, when a loved one ends his or her life by suicide, we feel guilty and regret things we have said or did to them, thinking that if we had done it differently, they would still be here. How to deal with that? I think um, one of the things that we have to uh, remember is that we are not that powerful. <laughs> we wish you had the power to change people, to change people's thoughts, to prevent people from doing this and that. We just not that much. We just not that powerful. Ultimately, we're responsible for our own lives and people responsible for theirs. We can only respond for our own selves. Now, this is obviously a very, very common feeling that we have whether people take their lives or not. So I would say two things, actually three. One is understand that it's not your responsibility. Two, for everything that you leave with that person in that relationship, no relationship is ever perfect, right? It's ever perfect. Um, so forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for your shortcomings. Um, and three, if you are really, really struggling with that, look for a psychologist because uh, suicide is a very traumatic experience. And when people commit suicide, it's an act of violence against the ones who stay behind. And consciously or unconsciously, a lot of times, that's exactly what they want to be seen and remember through your guilt, through the misery that they leave behind. And I'm not saying that this is a conscious movement, but psychologically speaking, um, a lot of times that is part of the process. And so understand that, um, you know, sometimes in order to deal with these feelings, it is necessary to look for some uh, professional help. But according to spiritism, you know, looking at the spiritist teachings, um, it's not your responsibility. The person is fully responsible for his or her acts and choices. Of course, there are things that we can all do better in all our relationships. There's always learning, but self-forgiveness, self-love, keeping an open mind to, to learning and knowing, knowing. The life did not end, whatever was not done right, many, many opportunities will be given. Um, healing is going to take place sooner or later. 
and harmony will be established, peace will be reestablished. The most important thing is not let grief and most importantly, guilt to stop your life. You need to keep living. You're here to live. You're here to, to have a mission, as we have said. So focus on fulfilling, moving forward, looking at what happens, important, but there's much to believe, there's much to be done. And, you know, life is waiting for you and for your contribution. So move on Thank the best way that you can. Thank you again, uh, my dear, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, you know, sharing this moment with us um, and and the choice of of um, multiplying life. Because in these moments that we're also together, thinking, uh, projecting ourselves into something positive. Guess what? We are contemplating life. We're we are multiplying life. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Abigail for being here with us, Leah. Um, and then finally, what I'd like to say is to give you, Susanna, um, a minute or two um, so you can say your final words and then I'll say the final prayer so we can conclude this amazing moment that we had this afternoon. Well, my, my final words are thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I felt uh, very moved throughout the, the, the talk. It's a very important issue. Let's keep talking about it. It's never, um, it's never enough. Um, a lot of people out there suffering, a lot of people in darkness, as I touched very briefly because of the time. The suicide is not something that is being um, resolved. Uh, kids are killing themselves at a younger and younger age. Adults. It's on the rise. We live in a world where we have this incredible gap between our intellectuality and our morality. So um, people are disappointed, they are lost, and we need to continue to talk about this. So let's keep talking. Let's keep bringing it up from time to time. Let's talk about um, our beliefs every time that is possible. Um, let's be available to others. Perhaps they don't believe in anything, but as I mentioned before, it's important that we live our lives paying attention to the people that are right, right next to us, our co-workers, our neighbors, you know, make ourselves available. Sometimes we're in such a rush to get things done, we have our life so full of stuff that someone needs to talk to us and we don't have the time to make a phone call. We don't have the time to listen for five minutes or whatever. So I think the message is this, uh, we need to make ourselves more available. We are dealing with a very, very profound problem that has very deep consequences in, in many people's lives. And there's always more than we can do. And talking about it is one of those things. Um, I, I just thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. I love you guys. It's just so nice to be here. I hope to, I hope to be back. I'm not inviting myself back. I just really appreciate your friendship and being with all of you. So I look forward to other opportunities. Thank you, Susanna. I think your words are mine too. We love you too. And yes, you will be back <laughs> if we can be here every weekend with us. But I know you have other places to be, other other friends to attend as well. And I think that's important that we um, share this with um, many others too. And I think we can also do this through, um, you know, the, the the hands that we extend to our friends or family members, those who are connected with us directly or not, um, and and fall back on the resources that we mentioned early, which is our um, uh, the websites of the Spiritus Centers, the material that we have, the friendship that we have established in the Spiritus Center. So extend a hand, extend a thought, and a word to everyone. On this note, I would like to thank everyone, invite everyone for our final prayers by thanking our dear Creator for providing us this amazing opportunity that we had this evening. Dear Mother, Father God, guide our minds, 
guide our hearts so that each one of us can put into practice these teachings, can be courageous enough to speak up, can be courageous enough to listen to one another, make ourselves available whenever possible. May your light be with us and never give up in life. Allow our brothers and sisters to continue by giving them courage. Allow ourselves to bear the difficulties of our lives with joy and always reminding ourselves that there will always be a new tomorrow, a new beginning. We thank you, Master Jesus, for being our guide and model. We thank you, dear Lord, for one another, for who we are in life in general, and so be it. We thank you until we'll see you next time. Thank you.